So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2008. If you've ever thought about writing novels, you might want to think about envying Sarah Zar's career. Her first best-selling young adult title, Story of a Girl, was a finalist for the 2007 National Book Awards. Book two, just released this month, is Sweethearts. It has earned glowing reviews and, even better, excellent sales. I interviewed Sarah uh, a couple months ago, the morning after the National Book Awards. She was a delightful guest, even in the face of disappointment, and I made her promise to come back when Sweethearts was released. So, Sarah, welcome back to Mr. Media. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's, <laughs> ha- Happy Valentine's Day to you as well. Uh, what are you up to today? What's, uh, how are you spending Valentine's Day? I am spending Valentine's Day unpacking uh, from my little sweetheart's tour, and then I'm going to help a friend move. And then I'm going to watch Project Runway, which was recorded last night. So if anyone calls in and gives it away, I'm going to have to hang up. So, <laughs> so that's right, my so that's my on. romantic day. <laughs> so you're all on your honor. Don't ruin Sarah's day. Yes. That's it, huh? No, yeah. Well, you know, um, I have to say Valentine's Day is not doesn't figure hugely in my life or my marriage. <laughs> um, well, okay, that's not true. Um, I think what I think about Valentine's Day is that it's a good excuse if you have a crush to let someone know. And so when I first met my husband, I did send him a little Valentine's card to kind of let him know that I was thinking about him. And then 17 years later, here we are. And he's still waiting for another card. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. I... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go out for dinner on Saturday night. It's kind of hard. I mean, it's Thursday night. Uh, kind of hard to make a you know big commitment in the middle of the week. Yeah, and every and the whole rest of the world is out for dinner, and you can do that anytime. Exactly. Not that exactly. I'm saying people shouldn't be out there stimulating the economy, but or each other. You can do that later. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, let's talk books. Um, how how different uh, is it publishing the second novel compared to being a first time author? It's really different. Um, it's uh, well, the writing process was a lot different because Story of a Girl was out while I was kind of finishing the last few drafts of Sweethearts, and Story of a Girl was doing well, and um, you know it was hard not to feel the pressure and feeling like there's something at stake now, whereas before there wasn't. Um, and the nice thing is with the second book, now I kind of understand what to expect in terms of what the publisher does, what I do, um, because there's no, when you get into publishing and publish your first book, there's no sort of guide for new authors <laughs> telling you how everything <laughs> works and what to expect practically and emotionally and all of those things. So now that I've been through it once, I'm a lot more relaxed this time and just enjoying it a bit more and not obsessively reading every single thing that every single person says about the book. So that's probably now, that, healthy. Now, Sarah, I have to ask you, because we, as you know, I mean, we, we share an agent. Are you telling me that, that Michael Bore, our extraordinary uh, agent, did not give you a copy of uh, book publishing for dummies? <laughs> he did not. And if he has one somewhere in his office, I'm going to find out about it and he's going to pay. Well, I don't, I don't know whether to feel uh, bad for you that he didn't give it to you or feel bad for me that he did give it to me and then <laughs> he didn't feel you needed it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that. Try not to take that for dummies thing personally. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me, uh, let me give out our phone number here. Uh, the, the fun part of this is uh, we can take live calls. If you're yes. listening to, sh- to the show right now uh, between 1 and 2 p.m. Eastern time on Valentine's Day 2008, Give us a call, uh, 646-595-3135. Um, and, and Sarah, I want, I've got to give you credit. that You are the uh, officially the first person to come back to do a second interview on Mr. Media. And, wow. Uh, you know, we're Thank glad you. to have you here. Yeah. 
So uh, one of the other things we talked about last time around was the possibility, and I note the possibility of the sophomore jinx. Uh, I think you were a little nervous about it then. I imagine you're feeling a little better about it now. I was very nervous. Uh, I mean, although at the time we talked, the editorial process was finished. It was completely out of my hands, so there was nothing I could do about it anyway. <laughs> but I have yeah. to admit that it was a relief to see the first couple of reviews from Publishers Weekly and Kirkus and um, get positive reviews. And then after that, I just kind of breathed out and figured, well, you know, some people will like it better. Some people won't like it as much. It's a different book, and I'll get some new readers and and that's great. So I'm just, I'm very relaxed. And of course, you know, having that nice National Book Award finalist sticker on my first book is kind of good for the self-esteem, if ever I'm feeling <laughs> you know, a little low. Uh, plus, you know, I've been thinking about that, and I don't know if you'll agree with me, but, you know, I, I, know, you, I know you were disappointed. We, as I mentioned, we spoke uh, the morning after the National Book Awards. Uh, you didn't win. Uh, my, my favorite story about that was uh, that you had, you had you had your uh, speech that so you would practice and got down to the right amount of time. It had never occurred to you to practice your reaction if you did not win, which right. I thought was wonderful. <laughs> um, the game face. In, uh, I'm sorry? The game face. The game face, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking since then, and this is where I don't know if you'll agree with me, but I, I sort of think that as a first-time author, maybe they did you, uh, maybe they did you a favor by not – naming you the winner because it just seems to me that anything you would do after that would be so hard to live up to having that tag national book award winner that it would be tougher national book award finalist gets to follow you around just the same and you don't have to produce the greatest novel on the face of the earth to live up to that the rest of your life yeah i mean i think i think you have a point and um you know i it definitely being a finalist was absolutely the best thing that could happen for my career. And but at the same time, it's just an award. So even if I had one, you know, I don't I don't know that it would. Um, you know, I have kind of mixed feelings about awards. Of course, if you get them, you think they're great and they mean a lot. <laughs> and then if you don't get them, you're like, ah, it's just an award. But um, I, I really do think, you know, now that I've had that experience behind me, and I and I like having the sticker on my book, but I also think. Writing is still hard. You know, every book feels like I'm doing it for the first time. Um, I want to do a lot of different things. And I know that when I read award-winning books, I don't always like them. So it's just, you know, the opinion of that particular group of judges for that year. And, and it's great for one's career. But it doesn't – it's not any kind of final verdict on your mm. ability as a writer or your value as a person. It's true. I, I remember uh... – been about 20 years there was a period of time when i was doing a lot of magazine work a lot of investigative stuff and and i, I remember uh much to my surprise i didn't even know that the magazine this magazine had entered my work into a, a competition and i actually won in one one award thing i think i won like five you know awards which was amazing because i'd never in my life won anything for anything I, uh, and uh so i was excited and and uh my editor at the time um, just decided to bring me back down to earth, uh, and he said, hey, listen, pro, that's what he called me, pro, listen, pro, awards are like assholes. Everybody's got one. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, okay, from then on, I never cared again. <laughs> I'm, was, somehow I'm glad I don't have someone like that in my life, but yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes you sometimes you know we we romanticize the old crusty old bastards in the business, and yeah. sometimes we could really live without what they have to say. <laughs> um, and now, uh, uh, story uh, story of a girl, which was a, a wonderful book. You know, you know, I, I really liked that a lot. And you. you had the luxury there of uh, keeping that book in the oven a long time. Uh, I mean, that was wasn't that a couple years to gestation. Yeah, it was a it was a few years. Mm -hmm. And then this one, uh, my sense is that you popped this one out, and I don't mean that in a <laughs> deprecating way, but you kind of popped this one out. I'm thinking in about a year, right? Yeah, and I th well, I think as we um, when we talked about it before, I mentioned that the there's so much during the time I was writing Story of a Girl, there was a lot of waiting. I mean, there would be periods of four to six months of waiting to hear back from editors and agents. And so it wasn't like I was literally working on it every day for three years. 
So, you know, now that I'm writing full time, Sweethearts just happened in a more compressed amount of time, but but there was no waiting. So I was working on it pretty much all the time. So so it is nice to have I mean, the waiting time is good. I mean, it helps you get distance from the work and you don't really have that luxury when you're writing under contract um, to just sort of let it marinate and stew and then go on with the rest of your life while you're, you know, waiting for magic things to happen in your subconscious. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it's definitely different and faster. And, you know, we'll see if I can keep up that pace with future books. I'm, I'm not sure about that. So, Have you, where are you, I know you have a, a contract for the third book. Uh, where are you in the process on that? I'm, I hope my editor isn't listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just me and you. It's <laughs> just me and you. It's just me and you, um, yeah. I'm, I'm like, I don't know, page-wise, I'm probably like a fourth of the way through the book, but it feels really rough to me, and, you know, I have to turn it in in December. So I've got a little while, but this year already feels like it's going by fast, so I definitely need to get cracking now that the Sweetheart's promotional stuff is dying down. Mm -hmm. And what... uh, um well, tell me a little bit about. I know. I know you, want, you, you certainly the book's not written yet. You don't want to give it away. But tell me a little bit about the process for you on, on working on a book at this point. You, you, you you've gotten past that uh, the first book and the elongated period of time, and now you're doing this professionally. This is how you're making a living. You're uh, so as you approach it. Tell me about a typical day. Uh, you know, are you first thing in the morning person? Or, you know, how do you uh, how do you approach actually doing the work of the writing now? I have tried a lot of different things in hopes that I hit upon something that is the magic key to making work easy and enjoyable all the time. And what I'm discovering (laughs) is that there is no such thing. And so, you know, I I don't like get up at the crack of dawn and start writing. One of the benefits of the self-employed lifestyle is, you know, having your own schedule. And so I like to ease into the day and sort of see my husband off to work and have my coffee. Um, And then then ideally, you know, before lunch, be good to get started and then maybe wrap up at like three or four and just kind of, sometimes that's just a lot of staring into space (laughs) and procrastinating and sometimes it's, you know, three or four hours of actual writing. It just really depends on where I am with, the book um, sometimes it'll really go pretty quickly in the beginning, and then you hit the middle, and you know how it's going to end. But meanwhile, you have to fill up 150 pages with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, not just stuff. But uh, my writer friends and I joke about we'll have sections of of drafts where we write. You know, stuff happens here. You know, to just kind of <laughs> we don't know what, but it's to remind us that something has to happen in the middle. Uh, that's you know that's the way I've always read. Uh, I've, I've always heard that that was the plan. Usually, that something in the middle something was... happens. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good sort of rule of thumb for fiction. Something <laughs> happens. Now, are you? I mean, have you have you found that there's a particular room you like to work in? Uh, any kind of music, or do you shut off the phone? You know, really take us inside the uh, the process for you. I I have a little work area in my house that I share with my husband. And then I also rent an office away from home because offices are fairly cheap where I live in Salt Lake City. And it's nice to have a place that's just mine and I can go to and get out of the house is the main thing because sometimes you can, you know, realize you haven't gone anywhere for three days and that's not a good way to live. (laughs) So, um, So, yeah, sometimes I'll work at home and just kind of, sit at my computer, and I used to work with music a lot, but I'm finding with this book I'm working on now that silence is working better for me. Uh, I don't turn off the phone, but I don't answer the phone, but that's nothing new. (laughs) I never answered the phone before. I just let the machine get it. Um, And, you know, I, I I try and keep myself off the Internet for like an hour at a time so that I can get a consistent thought process going. Um, I don't work in my pajamas generally, and I, I'm one of those people that I don't really feel like the day has started until I shower and dress and put shoes on. So 
I'm not lounging around in my pajamas and robe like some writers do. Uh, what I, do you I mean, I don't know if you're expecting me to tell you something really exciting about my lifestyle, but well, that's pretty now, much it, sitting at a computer. Well, Sarah, now I'm concerned that you've secretly got me on video, and you know I'm sitting here in my robe and underwear <laughs> conducting these interviews. I, uh, it, I thought the green light was supposed to come on if the video was on. I'm trying to get, get a handle on that. No, I'm just kind of curious. I mean, I, I know um, – uh, now, I don't do uh, fiction, but, I, you know, uh, I work on a lot of books, and I know it, it seems to go through periods where it, it, it swings. Like, right now, I, I just I like to get everybody out of the house. I like to get started early, crank up whatever, is, whatever I've got in iTunes lately, uh, usually something, something uh, 70s or 80s related because I'm an old man, and, um, uh, you know, and, and block everything out. But and uh, you mentioned the internet, and I wondered about that. It 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 is one of the most fascinating things in our lives, and it is the biggest time killer uh, around. It, it's uh, and I was curious if that if that was a problem uh, for you at all, and that you know you, you you do wind up devoting too much of your workday to it, and before you know it, uh, you're into the next day. It is a problem, and and the problem with it is just what you're describing that. It is work. I mean, as you know, you have to promote yourself, and if you want people to come back to your website, you have to have dynamic content that's changing, you know, hopefully daily or at least a few times a week. Um, And then there are emails to deal with. So you feel like you're working, and you are working, but that work never actually ends, and so you have to end it, you know, and just say, okay, I'm stopping this now for a few hours. Um, it's definitely a challenge. It's something that I, you know, will be the number one thing that keeps me from being as productive on the creative front as I want to be. And and it's a, you know, it's a positive for my career because a lot of the success that I've had um, has come from word of mouth and people who have followed my blog and feel like they know me and want to support me and then tell their friends. and And that's really good and it's been a positive for me, but at the same time, there does come the moment where you have to say, okay, I'm done with this now, and I have to write. And that's definitely difficult because writing, as you know, is hard. <laughs> <laughs> and for some of us, writing blog posts or answering fan mail or dealing with publisher stuff is easy. And so what are you going to do? You know, you're going to take the path of least resistance, which is the the business side of it, at least for my type of personality. So... The creative work is the part that's hard and scary, and so of course I don't want to do it. So I delay that as long as possible. So it's a good thing I have deadlines. I understand completely. Um, I want to say uh, we're starting to see some uh, some people show up for the uh, the uh, web chat that accompanies the live uh, interview today, and I want to invite all those folks if they'd like to submit a question uh, via the web chat, they can do that. Or we want to bring those Sarah Czar fans out of the woodwork. We've got some open lines. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got a call for you right now, Sarah. Hold on. Let's oh, great. See. Uh, hi, is there? Let's see. Oh, come on now. There we go. Is there a is there a question for Sarah? Yeah, there there is a question for Sarah. <laughs> oh, hi, Michael. <laughs> why hey, why Michael. aren't you working now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy doing publicity. Oh, so that's that that other kind of work you were talking about. Exactly. Very good. This, uh, and hopefully folks, we can uh, stretch this out all day. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a limit because I've got I've got book work to do too. So, um, <laughs> oh, okay. Folks, this is uh, this is Michael Bure with uh, Distal and Goderich Literary Management. He uh, represents Sarah and uh, this other loser, uh, me. Uh, Michael, uh, <laughs> it's true. Do you have any stories you can tell us about Sarah? Uh, you want to take us uh, back in time a little bit to uh, maybe when her uh, work first crossed your desk? Yes, when she was a wee lass. Um, yes. Before she'd written anything of substance, no. Um, yeah, no. Sarah's a, a, an amazing success story, obviously of her own, and and for her own reasons. But but for me, um, you know, as a writer who did come in through Slush with with a very uh, attention catching query letter um, that referenced Freaky Friday, and, and whether or not I had liked the original or the Lindsay Lohan version better, um, if anyone actually cares, I think they are both very different different films, and are both have their merits. Um, okay. <laughs> it's important. Uh, but anyway, I, and then, then she sent me her material, which was really great. And it, it was immediate from the first few pages and, and, and obvious that Sarah's a terrific writer. 
Um, and in reading the novel, it was, you know, it was 90% there and really didn't need much work because she'd been working on it for so long and really honing her craft and doing all of her homework and um, obviously approaching the right agent, which is so important. Um, <laughs> and so modest. I know. Yeah, really? Well, you know, but, but isn't, the right agent isn't necessarily, you know, some sort of number one agent on a list. It's about getting the right fit. And um, obviously I think it's been a good fit. Michael, uh, let me ask you this because, uh, you know, we probably have some people uh, listening uh, sure. or maybe reading the transcript later who are wondering how did she get that separation from the slush pile, which is, and for those who don't know, the slush pile is basically all the writers who send in stuff unsolicited and it just piles up and eventually the agents look at it. How did she, how did she get separation from that big pile of manuscripts to become you know, Sarah Zahr, National Book Award finalist. Well, there were two things. One was um, her query letter was well-constructed and direct. Um, was it the most brilliant, brilliant pitch for a book I'd ever heard? Honestly, Sarah, no. Um, but it said what the book was. It said what the book was about. So I understood. It also mentioned her qualifications, which were she had won an award, uh, the Utah Council of the Arts Award for 2005. Is that right? Uh, 2003. 2003. Jeez. I'm really fine. That's scary. <laughs> um, so, you know, the fact that it mentioned she had won an award, and then she really did add this personal note asking about Freaky Friday, which I reference on the website in um, an essay or something. Um, and, you know, I had that little bit of a personal touch. So between those three things, I thought, you know what, I need to take a look at this. Um, and then, of course, the, like I said, the manuscript spoke for itself. And then I did, um, and I tell this to the, aspiring writers who are on the search for for agents, I did follow up with him. I mean, a, a period of time had passed, and I was curious what was going on, so um, I sent him a very brief, courteous email uh, to just follow up. I actually and found that email the other day. Did you? Well, yes, we obsessively save all our communication. We do. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and that, I think, helped move it to the top of the stack, too, it, because I had experienced in the past with... Um, a magazine piece I'd done that sometimes those little follow-up notes or calls just remind people, oh, yeah, that's around here somewhere, and, and they pull it up. But you can't, you know, you can't harass them. You have to wait a reasonable amount of time and, and, and be brief. And no, and it, it was a very appropriate email that just said, I haven't heard from you in a little bit. You requested my email in this state, and I'm curious to see, you know, what you have to say. And Michael, um, when you started, uh, when you, you you took Sarah on as a uh, client, and when you started taking her work around, do you remember some of the response that you got early on? How did that go? The response was fantastic from the first person who read it. I mean, I sent it out, and I think it was three days later that someone said they really loved it, uh, had read it, was sharing it with other people, um, and we did wind up selling it at auction. Um, you know, it, it's very rare for a, a literary novel for the kind of fiction that Sarah does to, to sell at auction just because, you know, usually you find that one editor who really connects with it. But, um, yeah, everyone did. And there, was, there was no question that Sarah was going to be a star. I remember uh, uh, when, when you told me about Sarah, uh, and I was kind of, you know, I, I'm like, you know, young adult literature. I don't know, Michael, you know. <laughs> And, and you were like, L let me send you the book, read the book. And I read the book, and, you know, uh, 20, 25 pages, I'm thinking, okay, this is pretty good, but I don't know if I'm going to read the whole thing. And then somewhere, and I've, I've told this story before, somewhere around 30, 35 pages, I was just hooked. And, and I, think that, I think that that was something that happened with the second book as well. There is something, and, and maybe someone smarter than I can, can put their finger on it, but there is something in the nature of, of the way Sarah writes that just grabs you and you've got to keep turning those pages. And, and My goal uh, is to have that happen closer to page one. Thirty's <laughs> <laughs> a little far, but um, well, yeah. <laughs> well, no, but you but I'm, not the, I'm not the target audience either, so it's a little, well, I you, think it's a little, you know, a little tougher sell that way. And you do have to keep hooking people, which is, yeah. I think, the difficult thing. You know, it, it, the, the thing about books is you typically don't read them in one sitting, though I've had several people tell me that they've read Sarah's work in one sitting. Um, most people don't because you can't. It, it, it's too much time. Um, and most people, unfortunately, don't sit down with a book the way they do with a movie or you know, a, episodes of a TV show on DVD. Um, so you really do have to keep hooking them over and over and over again. And I think that's 
you know, in constructing a book and in the editorial process, that's part of the challenge is to, um, you know, keep that momentum going so that every time you finish one page, you want to know what happens on the next. And I, I can <laughs> comment a little bit just uh, on sort of a technical craft level of how how that happens, I think. Um, I do sort of think in scenes. I, I'm a big movie lover, and I'm from the TV generation. And so there's always, you know, that always before the commercial break, you know, there's something, oh, i got to keep watching that show. Yep. Or, you know, in a movie, each scene leads to the next and makes you want to keep watching. So when I end a section or a chapter, I try and, you know, whether it's an emotional note that, makes people want to read what's going to happen next or or an event. You know, I do think in those terms. And I I don't know if I started out doing that super consciously, but I think because of what I like about books and movies and TV and stories, it sort of happens organically in the way I write. Hmm. Hmm. Let me uh, interrupt for just a second and give out our phone number again. Uh, Folks, if you're hanging back, and I I know listening to uh, Michael is – is just, you know, more than the average person could handle, and plus you've got me and Sarah, but maybe you have your own question you'd actually like to ask. So the number to call, if you're listening live on Valentine's Day 2008, the number to call, 646-595-3135. We've got some open lines. We'll be happy to take your call. Um, So, Michael, uh, coming back to this, uh, how easy was it to go out and sell that second novel? And at what point in the process... Did that uh, did well, that happen? Well, actually, when we had the auction, we wound up getting uh, an offer for two books. So the oh. second book was under contract before it was even a twinkle in Sarah's eye, <laughs> um, which uh, you can ask Sarah <laughs> was both a blessing and a curse, I think. Um, and and since then, obviously, selling books three and four, which we just did in um, December, was much much easier. <laughs> even though the first time it was pretty easy. Um, her publisher was quite interested in working with her again. So you're back with Little Brown for three and four? Yep. Oh, good. Good. I'm very happy to be so. Uh, except for the actual having to write the book. Which is always, <laughs> yeah, as I hard. mentioned, that part's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is always, I think, what was the line? It is always easier to have written than to write. Yes. Yes. It's, it actually, it, you know, when I, look, when I look at Story of a Girl, or even more so when I look at Sweetheart's, you know, I look at the physical finished book and listen to people talking about it. I still, part of me just doesn't even know how it happened. You know, um, there's something about the writing process that's somewhat mysterious. And when you're in it, you just can think, this is never going to work. Um, and then just through revision and and just the natural process of evolution, uh, you know, you come out with a book and, and it's somewhat miraculous. I mean, it's, I can still hardly believe it myself. I mean, as Michael mentioned, having writing a second book under contract, you know, having the contract for it before I even really had the idea of what the second book would be was was different from the way I'd written before because when you when you don't have a contract, you can you can kind of start a book and and be with it for a while and and decide is this really the book that I want to write? Um and with when you write it under contract, you know you sort of turn in maybe 50 pages or so and a little synopsis, and the publisher says, "Yes, this does sound like the book that we want you to write." And um, so, if you change your mind kind of through the process, it's not impossible to, to to alter that course. But when you start feeling insecure, whereas when you weren't under contract, you might just move on to something else. <laughs> Once you know you're committed to that book, I mean, you have to work through the hard part. You're kind of married to it, and and you just have to, you know, to since it is Valentine's Day, you know, you have just like a marriage or a relationship. You have to work through the hard times, baby, mm. so that you can come out with something that you love. Kid, try jumping over to the nonfiction world, and we'll have that conversation <laughs> in a whole other way. Uh, <laughs> Michael, I know that your your two favorite writers are on the phone That's with you. That's true. Uh, and, and we are both except for all the committed. other favorite writers of mine who aren't on the phone with us. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I know that I was going to say, and, and of course Sarah and I are both committed to uh, projects uh, 
for the short and long term. Yes. So I don't know if you have time to stay with us if you want me to let you go. I actually, I, I am in the middle of negotiating a deal right now, but I, I wanted to call in and talk to my two favorite people who happen to be talking on this radio show right now. Um, Thanks for calling in, Michael. Of course. I told you I would, and I did. So there you go. Thank you, Michael. A man of his word. Enjoy the rest of your talk, and um, I, I'll, I'll be in touch with both of you soon. Okay, thanks. All right, take, take care. care. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, thank God he's oh. gone. <laughs> now <it's> really <laughs> All right, let's really talk about him now. Um, I have a uh, question for you from the uh, chat room. Uh, yeah. Call. Uh, that's C-O-L-L. I hope I pronounce it the way he wants it. He or she wants it pronounced. Would like to know how you got into writing in the first place. That it's funny. I've been asked that a lot while I'm while I've been out uh, promoting sweethearts, and I'm just realizing that I barely even remember. Um, But what I tell people, (laughs) I don't even know if this is true or just a construction of my imagination after the fact. But writer, um, make something up. (laughs) I always, this this is true. My mother read to us almost every night. Um, I loved books growing up. We, I didn't buy a book until I was probably in my 20s, really. I mean, I had a few books around the house. But in terms of, you know, my go-to place for books was the library, and we always had stacks and stacks of books. Um, so I was just really tuned into stories from an early age. And, and, and I don't know, you know, if it's a chicken and egg thing, but either as a result of all those stories or if it's just something in my personality and that's why I love the stories, I had a very active imagination. Um, my family was on the poorer side growing up, and so we didn't have fancy toys, um, <laughs> just books and a few stuffed animals and board games. And so... Um, My sister and I would play imaginary games all the time, and that was, you know, my favorite thing to do with friends. We'd we'd play Little House on the (laughs) Prairie-oriented games, wagon trains and um, orphanages with mean school marms, um, (laughs) you know, all sorts of of crazy stuff. And so I guess it's just sort of a natural progression to want to tell stories, too. Um, But in, in terms of writing as a career, I didn't... I didn't meet any writers till I was 24 or 25, and I've been telling this to kids when I've been doing school visits. Like, I never had an author come to any of my schools when I was a kid. I To think of being a writer as a career sounded to me a lot like saying, I want to be an astronaut or I want to be the president. I mean, I knew people did it, but they must be special people, not normal people, and I didn't realize it was something I could do for a job. So and then when I started meeting writers uh, I thought oh they're just they're normal people and um, they're just normal people who actually cared enough to finish books and rewrite them over and over again until they were publishable so I just decided that's what I wanted to do and I started doing that and thought my first book was great and it would be published right away and it <laughs> and it wasn't and then I thought well I'll write another one and and that didn't happen, and I wrote a third one and lost my agent over it. I had a different agent before Michael. Mm-hmm. And um, then I wrote Story of a Girl. So it was a process of failure and rejection <laughs> for 10 years, and then triumph. Well, um, Sarah, we've got another call here for you. I Great. think this uh, I think this is call from the, uh, from the uh, web chat. Um, uh, are you there? Yes, it's me. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to also ask you because it says that here you're a chicklet and you use a lot of your childhood memories and your other experiences in your books and it's young adult fiction. Do you have any other interests that you do that um, helps you to write? And is it completely different from your writing career? Oh, um... I probably don't have as many interests as I should. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like my life's a little narrow right now with so much focus on writing. I, as I mentioned, I, I love movies, and I, I feel like that sort of cross-pollinates my imagination in an interesting way. If I see a great movie, that makes me feel like I want to go write a story or write a book. Um, I'm really interested in computers and cooking. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of direct influence on my writing but anything you can do to have a full and interesting life and 
have friends and social interaction just all goes into that well of experience and imagination that you can draw on when you're when you're writing a book. And do you think you have to have um, a certain level of literary experience like doing a writing course or going on to further education in order to achieve what you want in literature? Did you just go straight into it? You know, I I think there are a lot of different ways to approach having a writing career. I didn't study writing in college. In fact, I was an English major when I started college, and then I hated it so much that I changed it to speech communications. Um, and then I never really took any official classes or workshops or anything like that. I was kind of learned by doing, you know, I just I read a lot and wrote a lot and as I mentioned, you know, wrote three three novels before my first published one, so I had sort of the practice of finishing a novel. Um and I was I think the best thing for me was I was in a writers group where most of the people in the group, all of the people in the group were a lot better and more experienced than me and I learned so much so quickly being in a group like that and reading their work and seeing what worked and having them read my work and comment on it. Um, so I don't, I mean, I think from what I've heard, people who do end up enrolling in creative writing MFA programs and things like that, it sort of accelerates the learning um, because you, by necessity, usually you're spending at least like 25 hours a week writing. And so, and that's when you're in school, you feel like, you have to do it because it's homework, and so it validates the time that you spend doing that, and it can accelerate the process. Whereas if you're, you know, sort of starting on your own and your friends and family are like, do you even know what you're doing and why are you spending so much time with this and you're not making any money, being enrolled in school kind of is a signal to them that this is what I'm doing. But I don't think there's any one right way to approach a writing career. Um, you, the main thing is to write. Are you, uh, um, how, you think... how did you go ahead? Sorry. No, go how ahead. did you? Sorry, thanks. How did um? How easy or difficult was it to get your first book published? It was difficult. Uh, well, I I should say I focused a lot of energy on finding an agent. I don't know if you heard um when my agent called in, but I always yeah knew, I did yeah yeah I always knew from the beginning that. I would not be good at the business part of it, um, not because I'm I'm not organized or smart or anything like that, but I knew emotionally it would be a lot of, I'd have a lot of doubts about what I was doing and I wouldn't know, I would be satisfied with a lot less in terms of attention or um, contract details, things like that, because I'm just kind of insecure. So I always knew I wanted someone to be kind of a business partner with me, which is what an agent really is. And so I focused virtually all my energy on finding an agent rather than a publisher. And so that was a really long, difficult process. I had one agent, and that didn't work out. So I fired her, or we ended our contract, and then I found the agent that I have now. And that whole process was, you know, three or four years. And um, But then once I had the right agent... And the timing, you know, there's sort of, you can do everything right, but then still timing has to work out. That The market's in the right place in terms of the kind of stuff you like to write, and then it ends up on the right editor's desk and you have the right agent. So in order for those things to converge, to work out for you, you just have to be patient and, and you know, have a writer friend who sort of likens it to standing in line for a movie or something. You just... Just stay in line. You eventually <laughs> get up to the counter, um, but if you get out of line, then you're not going to get a ticket. So you just there's a lot of people who want to be writers. You just have to kind of stay in the game and and keep going. And you have to make sure that it's really something you want to do because if you lose enth- enthusiasm, you're not going to put up with years of of waiting and rejection. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thanks for calling. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. So um, let me, uh, that'll open up an opportunity if someone else would like to call in. Uh, our number is seven, uh, no, that's my number, 646. Call Bob at home. <laughs> yeah, call me at home anytime. 646 uh, 595 
We've got uh, uh, about 15 minutes left with Sarah here. If you'd like to get a call in now, good chance to ask a question. Um, Sarah, uh, you uh, you mentioned uh, your uh, your blog before, and I want to give that out. It's www.sarah s a r a zar z a r r dot com. Um, how has that worked for you in terms of uh, you know promoting? Uh, your books and uh, interacting with your, you know, with your readers, your fans. I think it's safe to call a few of them. <laughs> I hope so. Um, it's it's been great. Um, I actually started blogging the second I heard the word blog. Hmm. I think it was like 1999 or 2000. As soon as I heard about this thing called a blog, where you could just spew your opinions all over the internet free of charge, um, I signed up. So. I had actually been blogging for a long time um, and read other writers' blogs and, and you know, a year or so before I even sold my book had kind of gotten into a little bit of a blogging network with people and already starting to meet other writers and aspiring writers. Um, I will say that when I sold Story of a Girl and I knew, you know, I was going to be a published author, I deleted my old blog, my whole one from like 2000 to 2005 because it was felt it was pretty personal and I just all of a sudden felt uncomfortable thinking I could be this public person and have so much personal information, not not in, not details, you know, about where I live or how people can find me and stab me to death, but <laughs> just um, you know, personal personal feelings and experiences and talking about friends and family and things. So I deleted that and kind of um I'm, I still get personal on my blog but it's it's personal with boundaries. <laughs> boundaries so are so good. Sarah, you deleted the stuff that might get you on Howard Stern and you kept the stuff that would get you on Oprah. Exactly. Exactly, Bob. <laughs> or on Mr. Media. Or um, on Mr. Media, exactly. <laughs> so well, but it's been great. I mean I know a lot of writers read my blog and a lot of librarians. And it, Blogging is a little, you know, if anyone out there who writes a blog, you can start to think that the only people who read your blog are the ones who comment, and that might be like 12 people. <laughs> and so you think, well, I've got 12 readers. I can be pretty loose. But I can't tell you, when I've gone to national conferences like the American Library Association and things like that, the number of people that come up and say, I read your blog every day, and they've never commented, and then you have to multiply that by, you know, whatever factor. So you do want to kind of make sure you're not coming across as a jerk. Well, or or or, or worse, I know uh, I maintain a couple of blogs, uh, Mr. Media, of course, and then some other things, and I have uh, cut back in what kind of information I'll put up there about myself or things because yeah you do realize that it's going out to a lot of people you really have no control over mm -hmm. and you know there's certain things you don't want to share you know uh, uh so, or or you know it's uh it's kind of an iffy thing there's a lot of pros but there's a, there's a few cons that are creeping into it as well yeah and i think i think another thing that writers need to think about is people involved in their career and who could have influence over the career reading their blog and if you kind of get a reputation as someone who's bitter or envious or, you know, kind of always talking bad about other writers or other books, it's not really good for you. You know, you need to find a trusted circle of friends to complain to, <laughs> but mm -hmm. not to the whole entire world. Well, I should tell you, uh, the uh, young lady who just called into us, uh, call, who's on, a, on the web chat, uh, just just mentioned that that she too writes a uh, blog weekly. So, yeah, I mean that you know, and, and I, I suspect she will probably find her way to your blog um, as well. Um, something I wanted to ask you about. Well, we still have some some time here. How have you celebrated the high marks in your career? Whether uh, you know finding out about the NBA award, the nomination, or the fi being a finalist there, or uh, you know, getting the uh, getting that new contract for the for the next two books. Uh, you know, have you done anything special for yourself, your husband? Celebrating is not my strong point. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people who always thinks when good things happen, they're going to get taken away any second. <laughs> I think that's just sort of a habit of childhood and the home I grew up in. So I would like to learn how to celebrate these things because I, I tend to just have a lot of stress and think that's. You know, I don't deserve this, or 
um, you know, people are going to find out one day that I'm a complete fraud. So that always taints my good experiences. So I'm trying to learn to celebrate things. Usually I'm just, I, I'm very grateful for ed- everything that happens. And I, it's more sort of a psychological thing. I sort of have a moment with myself and remind myself of all the years that I worked for it and wasn't achieving it. And there is a deep sense of satisfaction that comes but I don't, I don't think I celebrate. I'm kind of, I don't know. I mean, I celeb- every day is a celebration, Bob. This is my problem with <laughs> Valentine's Day. I have to express to my husband that I love him every day, and I'm sort of every day really glad to have a writing career. Um, I haven't gone on any extravagant vacations <laughs> or anything like that. I mean, maybe someday when I make my first million, I'll do something like that. But I think I spent enough money on clothes getting ready for the National Book Awards to count as my celebration for a couple of years. Now, you're still in uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, maybe not uh, some people's idea of, of where the author of uh, Story of a Girl and Sweethearts might be living. Uh, is that, that going to be a long-term uh, a point of residence for you, or are you going to uh, migrate to the big city? <laughs> I'm from the big city. I'm from San Francisco. I've been there and done that. And Again, maybe when I make my first million, I could afford to go back. Uh, but I really love Salt Lake, and we're here for my husband's job. And as long as he's happy with his job, then we'll be happy here. Um, okay. I don't, I don't know. I don't see myself. It's really all about his career in terms of where we live, and I'm happy to go anywhere. Although with all this snow, I really wouldn't want to go to the Midwest or the Northeast. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm flexible in terms of where where I live just based on wherever his job takes him. Uh, and there's you know there's ha- a lot of writers who live in Salt Lake and it's a pretty fun community and I set sweethearts in Salt Lake cuz I loved it so much and and though my editor when I first turned in a draft kind of said I don't know about Salt Lake <laughs> national, you know, titles if that's going to be a place p- people can relate to but we're all just normal people here with the same life experiences and emotions that people outside of Utah have. So, so in the end, it did end up staying set in Salt Lake, which I'm very happy about. Hmm. So you think you'll do more for the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Salt Lake than, pers- than pe- perhaps you did for Pacifica? <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of sense that for Pacifica, that you're to Pacifica what uh, – uh, David uh, David Simon is to uh, Baltimore. Well, you know, I think actually people who live in Pacifica totally get it. I mean, right. and again, as I mentioned before uh, in our previous interview, it's a great little place to live. I can see it as an adult, but it's a very appealing community. Not so much for a teenager uh, if you don't have a car. And, and I think people get it, and they know I'm not, you know, Hating on Pacifica or anything. <laughs> okay, we have a couple of uh, a couple of new people I think that have dropped into the web chat. So I want to give the phone number out one, maybe one last time. If anyone would like to uh, step up and uh, call and ask you a question, it is six four six five nine five three one three five. And I remi- want to remind everybody who's listening to please uh, mark Mr. Media's uh, podcast uh, as a favorite, whether you. Listen to it on Blog Talk Radio or subscribe to it in iTunes or on Blueberry or uh, Zencast, which we've just recently added. A lot of places to find us. We appreciate all the uh, favoriting and uh, reviews that you care to add. Um, So um, what's next? You've got a book that's due in December, and then you've got another one, I guess, what, a year after that? Yes, although I I think maybe it's 18 months after that. Because I, okay. as I mentioned, I wasn't sure I could keep up the pace, so we kind of built some more time into my contract, um, and just you know, living life. My husband's in grad school, so getting him through grad school, and then hopefully, story of a girl, the movie version, um, will happen. I mean, since we talked, there's officially a writer director attached, and now that the writer strike is over, hopefully that'll move forward, and that would be really exciting to see as well. Can you mention who the writer and director is? <laughs> yeah, it's um, Lori Collier who wrote and directed Sherry Baby, which was a really wonderful movie um, that had a few Golden Globe nominations the year it was out. And, and I think she's just 
kind of the right person for this movie. So I was very happy to hear that she was involved. That's great. I was actually moving towards asking you about that. And of course, because the, the movie was optioned, you are uh, one. What did we decide? What, are you one degree from Kevin Bacon? Uh, I think I might be two, or possibly three. I, I'm not what? sure if I, I'm not sure if the person who actually knows him is zero degrees or one degree. So oh, I, I don't know. I've met Kira Sedgwick now, so <laughs> maybe that's two degrees. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, what was that like? That must have been an interesting point. Where Where did you meet her, and how? You know, what can you tell us about that? Oh, it was great. I mean, she just couldn't be nicer and more normal, and it was really fun to talk about the book and imagine possibilities for the movie. And um, I've got nothing but excitement for that. It was very nerve wracking. I was <laughs> before the the actual meeting happened. I was probably more nervous than I've been about anything else in this whole process. I just felt ill, and um, but it was fine once once it started. <laughs> When and when and where did you meet? We just like met for coffee when I was in New York. Oh. I can't give you details, Bob. I have oh, to protect of course your you privacy. Who am I going to tell? <laughs> Who am I going to tell? And and what about uh, uh, Sweethearts? Uh, is there uh, is there any movie action on that? Not yet. Although um, the woman who who was Kira Sedgwick's production partner on Story of a Girl read and really enjoyed Sweethearts, and she also works as a scout for another production company and um, is passing that on to them with her recommendation. So we'll see. Hmm. All right. Let me come back to uh, a story of a girl. Cause I want to see if I can ask something in a roundabout way and get a different answer. Um, the thing I was not got... the school slut. <laughs> no, 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 that wasn't the question, but you know, if you're going to continue and insist that I, I guess we'll just have to accept it for now. Um, <laughs> but no, the question is, uh, I, 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 the last time we spoke, uh, I had mentioned that I got to the end of Story of a Girl and felt like I really wanted to know what happened to Deanna Lambert. And so my question is, uh, with uh, Kara Sedgwick's uh, production company, did they buy the rights to the book or the character? The book. Okay. The work. I mean, that contract was probably twice as complicated as my publishing contract. So I can't tell you for sure <laughs> all the different <laughs> things that were included. I mean, there might be action figure rights involved. I don't know. But uh, the the thing that's optioned is the work. Well, Tim, uh, the reason I ask is that Tim Dorsey, who has done a series of uh, Florida-based uh, crazy action novels, funny, silly, Carl Hyacinth-type books, had said that uh, – uh, his first book, he's written 11 of them now, his first book was optioned, and that gave them the rights to all the characters to do, uh, like if they wanted to do like a series of movies with that character. And so I'm looking for some way to find out what happens to Deanna Lambert. What can I say? <laughs> get, get to the I can write you, why don't you write some fan fiction? And you, you know about fan fiction, don't you? Yeah, I but mean, okay, can... but does Captain Kirk have to sleep with Deanna Lambert? <laughs> I, that's, all I, that's all I know about it. Yeah, and Spock is in there somehow. I'm <laughs> sure. Yeah, you can you can write your own write your own ending to that story. All right. So I guess the answer is that there's no movement on a sequel to Story of a Girl. No. Okay. I mean, yes, <laughs> that is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, you, know, you know, there was one other thing that came up, uh, sweethearts, and we haven't really talked about it that much, but it's it's uh, the story of these two. Uh, it starts off with these two kids who meet. I think they're about nine years old? Mm, yeah, I mean, they, they meet in grade school, so they know each other from probably age six or seven through nine. Since we spoke the first time, of course, I've had the opportunity to read Sweethearts. Uh, I was thinking about it this morning, though. It reminds me a little bit of... Um, uh, um, have you seen any, any of the episodes of uh, Pushing Daisies? No. Um, it's interesting. I, it reminded me of, of it a bit. Um, Pushing Daisies... Um, is this starts off with the story of this boy and girl. They're about five or six years old, and they just know somehow that they're they're meant for each other. And um, uh, then something terrible happens, and they're separated. Uh -oh. And they find each other years and years later. You know, uh, in their I, th I guess technically they're like in their twenties, which is a little older than than your two. And I just thought, wow, just a, I mean, there's no there's no connection between the two. I'm not saying one 
had anything to do with the other. It couldn't possibly. But it reminded me of... Are you accusing me of something here, Bob? No, 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 no. I wouldn't do that at all. I wouldn't do that at all. But I was curious whether you had seen the show. Uh, That's all. No, I I haven't. And the the funny thing is the inspiration for Sweethearts came from a real-life experience that I had with a childhood friend who then found me years later, and now we're very good friends. Um, And I, I think it's interesting when that happens. You know, I... My wanting to write Sweethearts was part of sort of an effort to understand how people who hadn't seen each other since they were nine years old could meet again at 37 and still experience a strong bond and feel just easy together and like they'd known each other their whole lives. Hmm. Well, um, Sarah, I, uh, I enjoyed. We've had another hour together here. I really uh, enjoy talking to you. Um, I, I hope we'll get to do it, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe this time next year. I don't know when. I guess it'll probably be later than that when uh, the third book comes out. But yeah. I, I'm, g- I'm going to make you promise now that uh, you'll come back and we'll do this again. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, Sarah, thank you so much um, you. for joining us on Mr. Media today. And, uh, folks, to follow the uh, continuing adventures of Sarah Zar, which sounds like a book title in itself, uh, visit her personal website, www.sarazarr.com. And you can order her books, Sweethearts and Story of a Girl, at great bookstores everywhere. And for dozens more celebrity and media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com, where you can listen to my conversations with Billy Bob Thornton, Cheryl Hines, Milo Ventimiglia, David Fury, Anna Gunn, Stefan Pastis, and many others. We'll read full transcripts. And please come back again next week for another Fridays with Mr. Media.